Welcome to the Startup Grind. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Morgan and Clara Buchanan, who's going to be interviewing Morgan for the next uh, little bit. So come on out, guys. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, I'll introduce myself first because the rest of the night is going to be about this gentleman here. Um, so, I'm Claire Buchanan. I'm CEO of Hypergrow, which is a growth strategy and user acquisition consultancy here in the city. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about tech and we're going to talk about how your company got started and all those things. So first off, who knows about Adore Me? Who's heard about it? Who's visited the website? Maybe you're a consumer. Cool. So for those that don't know, um, Adore Me is a uh, subscription base and also um, sort of pay-as-you-go lingerie service. You want to tell us more? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, first off, thank you for thank you for coming tonight. Um, I guess when you when you guys raised hands, it was about what twenty percent of the people that have heard of us. So I guess it means we still have some work to do, which is a good thing. Um, so Adormi is a company that is about uh, four something years old uh, that basically completes this Victoria's Secret offering lingerie, uh, any type of underwear, swimwear, anything you can find at Victoria's Secret, except we sell it online and we sell it for a much more affordable price. Um, that's basically the, uh, the idea. Um, if you think at Victoria's Secret, because uh, most of the people in the room are males, I mean, at least 60, 70%. So for the ones who don't know, Victoria's Secret has a monopoly in fashion, which almost never happens uh, in that category especially, but almost in any category, to be some sort of a gillette in the world of razor for men. And so as you, as you think of the reasons why, there are tons of reasons why they have been having this monopoly for now 20, 25 years, and we're the first company to actually really break into and, uh, and create something out of it. Um, so in four years, we went from pretty much not existing to this year, being on a roll to achieve somewhere around 100 million dollars of revenues um, and to achieve that on the way we raised about um, 15 million dollars uh, from various angel and, and, and venture funds so that's a in a nutshell we're based in new york a few blocks away we sell essentially in the u.s a little bit in canada um, yeah cool so it seems like you're really going after Victoria's Secret there, and you're really going after their slice of the market share, et cetera. Um, is there any other competitors to you right now that would be the same sort of business model as you? Or no. no, many many people try to break into lingerie, and if you want to try it, please reach out to me. I'll give you some advice on how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but it, it's it's been a market where so many people have tried and failed miserably. Whether it is other startups which for most didn't get any traction, or whether it is big companies. I mean, Abercrombie, for instance, tried to launch a lingerie category four years ago, and they had to shut it down after two. Mm -hmm. and, and they're the kind of guy who wouldn't like funding when they try something, given their size and revenues. But it's just a very hard category to execute on because, I mean, there are many reasons. But essentially, the product requires uh, a huge lead time between conception and delivery at your warehouse, huge minimum order quantities, and um, the number of sizes is also very wide. So all together makes it a real maze, which is for most the reason why many people tried and failed. So we had a very uh, data-driven approach that could somehow circumvent most of these issues, but we're still not done with, uh, with some still growing and still feeling that we need to improve our game to step up and become a several hundred million dollars of companies in the revenue side. I hear you. And so why did you want to start a lingerie company? I mean, just saying, um, you're a guy. <laughs> and so I'm sure you weren't, you know, fitting on a bra and saying, oh, this doesn't fit right at all. I'm just going to go off and make my own brand. So what How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Well, touche, sir. <laughs> so, no, I mean, many, uh, I guess, many reasons. When I, I mean, it's not just I'm a guy, it's I'm not even American. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about online. I, I had never ordered anything online myself before I started this company. So mm -hmm. I was really definitely not the right type to, to start a lingerie online company in the US. But <laughs> I, still, I still tried. I mean, I, was, I came here because I really wanted to start a business and the US is the best ecosystem to do it. I had tried in Europe before and felt that it was hard. So I figured, gosh, I got to got to come to to New York or to the Valley to make it happen. And so I first came here to study. That was kind of my gateway to the country. I studied in Harvard for two years doing the MBA program. And while I was on campus, I had many ideas. So lingerie was just one of them in some sort of a funnel of call it 30 ideas. M many people say, and maybe not you guys here because you are a startup audience, but uh, many people say, oh, I wish I could start a company, I just don't have the idea. I feel they're so full of shit. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, the idea is not really what, what should bother you from starting something, and it's heavily overrated. I mean, you, you could start a, a pizzeria restaurant one block away if you have the best pizza in New York, you surely have many people coming to your place. So it's about doing things better than others or innovating. But if you don't have any idea, just take something and do it better. And so I had many ideas of things I could innovate with or do better or kind of a mix of both. And I, I just put all of these ideas in some sort of a funnel where I looked at each idea one by one. And, and ultimately, I decided that that would be lingerie. Now, if the question is, how did lingerie get in the funnel? That's more of a, <laughs> that's more of a girlfriend related story. Um, I mean, I was, I was just looking at different things and, and one day, she told me, um, hey, you should, uh, you should try this up for lingerie. And, uh, and I, I, I tried also at some point I figured I wanted to buy something for her and I went to shop for lingerie myself and I figured it's really expensive. And, um, and actually she's right, we should do something for lingerie. So I tried to have as a mission to save the lingerie industry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it seems like a very noble mission. <laughs> Love Thank it. You. So how did you filter out those 30 or so other ideas? What was your yeah. sort of things that you eliminated them by? Was it revenue models? Was it Yeah, it's a, it's a like bit of everything. Like I had a list of criteria from market size to margin structure to competitive landscape. I mean, very uh, McKinsey type of, of framework because um, I worked at McKinsey before Harvard. So it was like my way to to filter out. Um, and so, you know, it was very, very quantitative. I would call people from the industry I would look at and just try to understand how it works because most things are not written in reports or brokers' opinions or whatever, but just you need to, to grind it and to, to call people to see what they feel. And that's what I did for, for a few months. And then I figured, okay, I think I have a winner. But Ultimately, if this one wouldn't have worked, I would just have, I guess, tried it for a year and, and moved to another one. I, I was not attached to lingerie. I was attached to the idea I would make something for myself. So that's what really mattered most to me at the time. So you're an entrepreneur at core, a yeah. rebel, should I say? <laughs> I mean, even, even this company, I, I love what we do and I, I'm very proud and I love my team, but I wouldn't say that I will still be there you know, I don't know, we'll see. So if you reach um, an acquisition or something later on in the future and then- No, I don't, I, I don't look forward to one. sell. It's not, I, I like to build, I'm a builder more than a seller, but at some point, even if we don't sell, the company is gonna become public, um, so we'll see. Uh, the, the beauty of a business is not when you build it for, for yourself, it's when you build it for your customer and that actually the business can walk on its own without you, like, you know, a baby that grown up and now you're okay. Yeah, I don't need to pamper you anymore. So if I can reach that level with the company, well, that's beautiful. Yeah, I guess it is. It's true. So about the toddler phase, let's mm -hmm. say, in your company, mm -hmm. what are some things that happen where shit just hit the fan and you're like, oh, screw this, I'm done. <laughs> you were just like, I completely, I'm throwing away this idea. And then you maybe woke up the next morning and was like, okay, let me take another crack at it. <laughs> Walk so, us through some of that. I never, 
and, and I had many problems and some of them were really bad. I never felt I'll stop. I never felt I'm done. I've always felt shit. Uh, but I've never felt I'm done. Like I really, I mean, to me, the only alternative would be to make it work. And if I didn't manage to make it work, the alternative would be to find a fucking way to make it work. So <laughs> I, I never really envisioned not working, but I just envisioned many scenarios, including doing something else than laundry, where it would ultimately work. Uh, but once we started to work on this idea, I mean, I guess two, two main crises happened to the company. One was related to funding, and one was related to inventory management, which is the hardest thing in, in, in our industry. So the funding one was, I mean, I guess, when you start to operate a company, you have a burn, and this burn increases month over month, as hopefully your revenue increases too, but there is still a minimal amount that you have to burn to grow. My burn at the time was somewhere around 30,000 a month. Can seem huge, can seem small. It's just what it is. At some point, every company goes through this, I guess. Month. And I was discussing with some investors to raise about a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And um, they had said, sure, we love the company. We'll do it. Here is a term sheet. I sign it. I'll invest in a few weeks. We just need to negotiate a few things in the meanwhile. And the few things on their end took so much time and the due diligence that the months became three months, which was fine, but you never really know until it's done. And, and what happened is the day before they should have wired the money, they decided to ditch the investment, even though legally they had to invest. Like they should, but they just didn't. And at the time, my issue is that I had signed some sort of an exclusivity agreement with them because that's what they wanted. And so it took longer than expected, blah, blah, blah. And when they ditched us, I had two weeks of money left on the bank account. So I had 14,000 left and we were burning 37 a month. So it technically means we were to be bankrupt in 14 days. So that was, that was a hard time, especially since it was on December 26th, which is not the period of the year where most people are very responsive to emails and phone calls saying, hey, I need money. So, so, you know, happy new year. Uh, and, um, and that was hard. It was really hard. I was, I was imagining my team of, at the time, maybe 10, 12 people ahead of me saying, hey guys, I cannot pay you this month and we cannot pay the supplier too. And it's kind of a mess. And, you know, that was something. So ultimately, I managed to turn it around and call anyone I could to try to raise money. And, um, I mean, two months later, I managed to raise two and a half million. So that, that was okay. We were off the grid, but still it's been two and a half months where I barely slept. Um, and the inventory crisis was another period where it was the opposite. We had money in the bank, but we had committed to buy an amount of goods that was superior to the amount of money we had in the bank because we didn't have the system to deal with inventory management. Because when you need to order things a year in advance, it's really hard to predict what's gonna be your growth versus the inventory you commit to purchase. Yeah. And, and we needed to issue payment that would pass what we had in the bank. And that was also super hard to deal with with the manufacturers. And that was another maybe six months of negotiation with the supplier, cut back, uh, hard times, finding ways to liquidate the inventory. And that was really tough. And and mm -hmm. I saw the three years I had worked with at some point going in the wall and I would never accept it. I would have killed myself before I would kill that business. So I made it work. So now we have all the system in place to make sure inventory is managed tightly and we have all the security in the world about cash because basically we learn from these two mistakes or yeah. two situations, call it how you want. But um, these were hard moments. And then there were also good ones. But and God. Yeah, I think that's terrifying. Like I can't imagine being in those situations and just honestly not knowing what to do. Um, it sounds like you're scrappy and you got through it though. So looking back, what would you have told yourself in that moment when you were signing those first term sheets, et cetera, 
how would you have been able to have like a fall safe or like some sort of safeguard against? It's hard. I mean, ultimately, it means I should have said no to the exclusivity um, paragraph they wanted. But I mean, if you did something at the point in your life, it's probably because given the state of the world around you, you felt it was the best decision to take. So going back and say, I should, I could, okay, I could, if you had known this would happen, but the point is you didn't know. So I wouldn't change anything. I'm happy. It taught me life. It's okay. <laughs> like it taught me it's okay. It made me stress out to hell and back, but it's okay. <laughs> You're very optimistic. I like it. Um, yeah, so tell us some good moments then. Let's balance this out. Um, I guess good moments is when you share good things with your team when you achieve milestones. So, I mean, sharing good moments with the team um, happens really on a weekly basis. And, and they're really great moments. Just walking in an office where you feel you like everyone and you like what you build is a really sweet feeling on a daily basis. And, and that's probably the sweetest and also the strongest of, of all. So that's good. And I would say that's really what holds most people to keep on being at Adormia right now. Our churn rate on the, I mean, on the team member side is probably next to zero. We never had someone leaving saying, hey, I'm leaving because I don't like working here. It might have happened maybe twice in five years or something like that. So knowing that now we are 100 people, it's, it's very, um, very slim compared to many things I can hear left and right. So people really like to work together and then that's probably the best feeling of all. And then other good moments are when you raise money. So we had three rounds of capital and each round was a celebration. For the biggest round, I even took the whole team for a three day trip in Los Angeles at the time just to, uh, to have fun and celebrate that. So that was cool. Yeah. And, then, um, and then just when you do great revenue uh, milestone, like the day when we made for the first time $100,000 in a day, the day we met for the first time, five hundred thousand dollars in a day. The month when you make your first million. The moment when we poached and recruited the former head of design at Victoria's Secret as our head of design was also cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's how you found good talent. So a hundred people mm -hmm. in four years with as much money you're making. That's small. It's it's a million per head. So it's it's better than Goldman Sachs. Yeah. <laughs> True. Good job. We try, wow. we try to we try to automatize a lot of things. So the the point is, ultimately, customers are happy when they are empowered. So in the beginning, we would do many things manually or over the phone, and it was a mess. We had so many people complaining, "Hey, I had to wait forever to get to an agent, and they couldn't even handle my request." Another agent told me something different. So we built a whole automation platform where everyone can self serve themselves. That was great. And then when someone in the office does something that is somehow repetitive, we always try to find IT capacity to automatize what they do and really focus everything they work on on the value-added part so that, I mean, hopefully um, they don't do anything that is no value-add and, and, you know, you, you need fewer but higher quality people. So that's what we try to do. Yeah, I agree, definitely. And plus, it's also cultural fit. It's like with that small of a group of people, and then there must be a thriving, beautiful soul within the company, a, mm -hmm. a very distinct feel and very distinct culture. That's what Storm means. Yeah. Some are roommates. Some are like more like uh, dating each other. Some are more like, I don't know, it's fun. <laughs> Adorable. <laughs> Matchmaker and CEO. <laughs> okay. It's amazing. So you've had this fantastic success. Going into this, do you think this was in the future? Like, were you sure that you would get this big or? Yeah, I wasn't sure at all. I mean, when, when you start a company, you're like, if I can reach and sell the business for, you know, you have these figures in mind, everyone has their own. But I was like, okay, the average startup that is successful sells between 20 and $30 million in the US. So if I can sell for 25 million, I'll be very happy. <laughs> and so then you back engineer how much money it makes for you and you're like, okay. And then, and then as the company grows, you're like, okay, but actually this is not the right way to think it. It's about what you can do vis-a-vis -vis what, what you have and what is next milestone and, mm -hmm. and we, not the value of the company, but where the revenue level can go. And 
And then you say, okay, I did five this year, maybe I can do 15 next year, that's a great challenge. Mm -hmm. And then you do 15 and you're like, okay, I'm gonna do 40 and you do it. And then you're like, okay, so now it's not about revenue, it's actually about the mission you have and, and really changing things in an industry and mm -hmm. brand image. And, and, and you're, you're, it's, it's a moving target that, that grows with, with the company and that grows inside of you. Can you predict it early on? No, but can you have somehow some sort of a impossible to move away from your desire that you will somehow make something out of it? I guess, yeah, but you don't know where it's gonna go. I mean, I guess it's so industry specific. Um, maybe I see some friends of mine who started companies and they sold their business after 16 months because someone came and said, hey, I'll actually, buy you for whatever and, and you come and work for me for two years after that and they do the deal and you know it really depends what you do but now with adore me i think we can really build a multi-billion dollar business so i guess that's a fun challenge and and then we'll see awesome um and it's unique as well because you basically have a SaaS model applied to a retail clothing line effectively yes yeah, somehow so a uh, significant share of our customer decide to subscribe. Um, so yeah, it gives recurring revenues. But in, in the second phase of the life of Adormi, I could totally imagine that actually a la carte purchase becomes what's the majority of transactions. If we go retail, we are right now closing a deal with Nordstrom and we'll do a pilot this summer to see how it goes. If next year we roll out into thousands of, of, of Nordstrom, maybe a sizable share of the business could, could come from retail. If Mm -hmm. We do, um, I guess, other countries. Maybe we are right now looking at uh, China. I like China very much. Uh, it's very big. Uh, it's a great country to have a business in. So mm -hmm. who knows if over there it's going to be a people like subscription or not. I have no idea. So we'll see. I mean, I guess one of the main quality that we had over time is that We've been amazingly flexible, trying to always get customer feedback <laughs> and adapt what they would uh, tell us through their action or yeah. their survey. And um, you know, right now it's the right way to do things because that's what keeps most of them happy. Mm -hmm. If ever this changes, we'll have to adapt. And I'm sure that the future will be made of many moments when we adapt things. Yeah. Um, and how was user adoption to the subscription model? Because I know, like for example, Just Fab. Um, and a bunch of the companies they acquired, should I say, they run a similar sort of subscription model service. But for them, um, they had a lot of fallback. They had a lot of uh, lawsuits and all sorts of customer sort of lashback at that subscription model. For me personally, like um, just like reading um, the review of it, it made me think that maybe their UX was poor, maybe their customer support was poor. But I mean, I, I, I that. just thought there's like a particularly I would say bad um, practice to to follow. They they would not necessarily be very upfront about the fact that there are subscriptions, so people were surprised to be inside the membership, and then it would be hard to cancel. So we really try to actually be super proactive about people understanding what what they choose. So first, they can choose a checkout, a la carte subscription. If it's subscription, it's written the full sentence that explains it's a subscription with the detail of it. So assuming they read, they should know. Some people sometimes don't read. So we add in the box some sort of a booklet explaining it is a subscription you just signed up for. We send them SMS reminders. We send them email reminders. Mm -hmm. We offer um, store credit, which never expire. That can be refunded anytime. So we really try to make it super friendly to the customer so that actually most know what, what they do and, and the few who don't know, they can uh, don't feel uh, any pain because it's super flexible. Um, and I think it's the only way to really build a membership because um, if, if some people are unhappy with the experience, they'll let you know. And it's been the case since we started because we've not always been at the level where we wanted to be, sometimes restricted by IT capacity, sometimes because our hypothesis was wrong and we had to try something which didn't work out. But each time we learn something, we adapted it. And I think now, if we look at the past um, few weeks, which had Valentine's Day uh, as, a, as, as a huge peak of sales for us, obviously, uh, things went really smoothly. And, and the proportion of people that ever complained was below 
one per thousand. So I'm very excited about that. We need to keep it that way, really. Um, that's the only way to grow and build a sustainable company. If, if I wanted to sell the business at the end of the year, maybe I would look forward to optimize revenues and I wouldn't care about customers. And, but I'm really here to, to build something that will stay after me. So I want it to be solid. You're here to, be, you're here to build a legacy. Not a legacy, <laughs> just a good business. <laughs> legacy, hopefully, is going to be more than a business. I hope so, too. So we're going to do questions after my next question. <laughs> so everyone prepare. Don't all raise your hands at once. Okay, do. I'll choose. <laughs> but so looking to the future, what does it hold for you? What are you guys looking to do next? So next, uh, I touched on it a little earlier, but next, which is probably was the most boring question for you guys, because you're like, yeah, but this guy is already making 100. Why do I give a fuck about what's next for him? <laughs> uh, but next for us, um, is going to be, uh, well, we, at some point we'll need to, to do something about IPO or no IPO because any investor coming on the way wants liquidity. So yeah. if they want liquidity, you have to give them. So it means either be acquired or IPO or find a smart way to get them to that liquidity level. So this is going to happen. Um, that's for the financing part. And for the... Um, Operation part, it's going to be trying to be very big in the US. We already are on our way. Um, this year, our television budget is going to be close from a fourth the television budget of Victoria's Secret. And next year, it should be two thirds. So we are getting there. And, um, and then maybe retail, or we'll see. And, and international uh, is going to be fun too. So that's what's next for us. And, uh, Mm -hmm. At some point, we'll see if the company can go big on, a, on that direction. I'll be, I'll be very happy for everyone. Well, it sounds exciting and risky and enthralling and <sighs> adrenaline filled. <laughs> sounds good. Okay, let's open up the questions. Who has one? Mike. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Sasha's coming around with the mic. Um... You first, you're closer, <laughs> Josh. So how long did you uh, spend in the ideation phase when you were coming up with the idea? And yeah. yeah. Idea phase was altogether, I would say about a year and a half out of which a year was when I was a student. So really six months after graduation and while I was a student, I tried different things. Some idea, I push them until, call it a minimum viable product type of execution to see where it could go. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they didn't work out because not everything works out at the, at the first time. And, and then when it was about a dormy, it was like maybe three, four months of deep research on three, four ideas, really, out of which I chose that one, which, which wasn't called a dormy at the time. But, so, you know, you need also to learn how to do research. It's not something you do right from the go. So everything is kind of a learning process. If now I had to start researching on a new idea, it would probably take maybe only one month or two. But when you do it for the first time, if it takes six or nine months, it's not an issue at all. It's actually maybe the smartest six or nine months you'll ever invest because you're meeting with people who know more than you. And that's when you learn most, really. So. Her. <laughs> she seems really excited. Yeah. <laughs> oh, one second. Let's bring. Oh, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm fascinated about uh, the fact that you're doing lingerie. Okay. I have two questions. So one is you keep mentioning Victoria's Secret, and um, you know I know this is probably not a popular thing to say, but I'm, I was never crazy about their stuff, but they really did fill a niche here in the United States because you had uh, very expensive lines like La Perla, you know, on Madison Avenue that people couldn't afford, and then you had uh, Target. So, you know, it's, um, although it's a brilliant idea that's been here for 25 years, I'd like to know how you are different than Victoria's Secret. Okay. I mean, why would I want to come to you besides the online part of it than go to a store? That's question number one. Okay. 
And do you want me to ask the other one right now? So oh, no, she's leading. <laughs> um, if it's connected to the previous question, then yes. If it's it could not, be. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Because obviously you're a very intelligent person with a really good education. But you mentioned that whatever you learned about the business that you're doing, you really didn't learn it in school. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. if you could tie those two together, um, that would be great. Okay. Okay. So question number one is, how are we different from Victoria's Secret? Mm -hmm. So first, just to step back, I think this question, a little bit like the, uh, I don't have an idea question is really overrated. And, and my take on this is, we're gonna end that conference. Every one of us is gonna go to eat somewhere. Many of us are gonna go to a place next door. How is it differentiated for the next one? I don't know. It's the distribution network. So distribution, is really a key to actually making sales. If I were to build the most shitty bra on earth, but I have it in every single Walmart, I swear to God, I'm gonna make shitload of money at the end of the year. So distribution is a huge part of why you sell. Differentiation only comes second. And I really want to put this forward because many people have it wrong. So build, be able to build a distribution when you do commerce is really what drives you to sell. Mm -hmm. and uh, the quality of your product and the differentiation is what makes people actually like the brand, repeat, build over time, but revenue can really be made on distribution. That was the case, for instance, for Just Fab or for many others that had products that were questionable on the quality side, customer offers that were questionable on the understanding of the membership side or whatever, and, and I'm sure that you can all think of some shitty product as your daily next to your house, which you wonder why they sell it, but actually, they happen to be bought by people because they happen to be there. So distribution is the reason why we grow and we are fucking good at distributing our product. It's number one. Online, television, radio, everywhere. Then differentiation. Yes, there is differentiation because if there were to not be, the company wouldn't be sustainable over time. Differentiation at Adormi comes to many, many uh, aspects. The first relates to our mission. Our mission is to provide nice lingerie, uh, fine lingerie to every woman in America. And every woman means every wallet, every taste, and every uh, size. So if I start by um, any, so let's say every, every taste. So we really try to cater to any taste from super conservative to super sexy, which is something where Victoria's Secret sometimes is a little bit uh, limited. They're, most of their products are look-alike in that push-up type categories, and there are a few contours online, whatever, but it's not, sorry to be technical, but it's not like super diverse. They don't have any European flavored refined lingerie. They don't have super sexy, kinky uh, shit. Like that. They're really like focused on their core. So we are more diverse and we offer a broader array. The second is size. That's probably one of the big ones. Uh, Victoria's Secret do not serve the plus size market, which means if you're above size 10, you're not invited to the party, which means 40% of women in America cannot purchase from Victoria's Secret. So we do all sizes from petite to plus. We are the only lingerie company on earth to do that. And we're very proud of doing it. Our catalog has some regular and some plus size model. And the echo from any generation, the millennials or the older generation is very positive feeling this feel of inclusivity makes them feel good, whatever their size is. And ultimately, it's very complex for us to deal with from many standpoints, design, logistics, inventory management, cash, whatever. But we are super happy to do it, and that's a key differentiation. Third differentiation is overall um, the experience. So we ship in a beautiful box that customer sometimes keep to put jewelry in after the purchase. Uh, Victoria's Secret ships in an envelope. We ship in three to five days. They ship in eight to 10. We ship for free. You have to pay $10 for shipping. Um, our app is really slick and they begin to copy what we do. I mean, there are many things that on the customer experience, we do much better. Uh, and finally, price is also the, the last pillar of, of our values. We really want to be super affordable. So I would say when you pay something at Victoria's Secret for $80, $90 bra and penny, at the dormy, you're gonna buy it for $39. And the quality is equivalent to better, depending on the product. 
And so if you have something that is better quality in every size with a better experience overall and with even a broader range of style, then you have something that is really compelling for the customer. But if you have only this and not the distribution, I really challenge you to make $10 a month. It's, it's really hard. So, so I would say it's both combined that really drove us to, to be where we are. And then on your second question on um, do you learn in school the stuff that helps you building successfully a business, the answer is definitely no. Um, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't benefit. It doesn't mean that it doesn't contribute either. I think it's both. I mean, um, if it depends what you care about. I mean, ultimately, again, I think this might not be putting the, the, the question in, in the right frame if, if someone asked themselves a question. If, if I were to have someone asking me, should I study or should I start a company? My answer would be, dude, are you gonna live a hundred years? Why do you fuck bother me about two years of school? Just just do whatever you want, you'll have time for both. And, and I think people should just embrace both and maybe they can start a company while they're a student and, and you know, stop having all these concepts about life that is either or. If, if, if you're really good, just embrace both and, and you'll be fine, you'll be better. First, let me compliment that first answer was killer. Good job. <laughs> okay. Mm, you. I like your top. <laughs> Thank you. What, what did you buy your top? Uh, Talk about TV. Oh, should I stand away? <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, hi everybody. I'm Parisa. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for a great conversation. Uh, secondly, uh, Morgan, you mentioned that you said that your girlfriend inspired you to uh, create a line of lingerie brand. Actually, uh, my ex-boyfriend inspired me to create a line of handbags that um, capture and portray each stage of a relationship. Um, I broke up with him last year, and that's when <laughs> I also started my own business. Um, just kind of through the recovery process uh, and gain support through friends, uh, decided to, uh, this is one of it, which is the final stage. I have five stages of, uh, of the bags and this one is called Freed, which uh, kind of talks about, <laughs> it's the time to let him go and to really go on new adventures and try new things. Uh, my question for you is that uh, in terms of sales, um, from the, for the very beginning of the business, just dating back for how many years, four years ago? Yeah. Yeah. When you first started, um, you didn't really have that much cash flow coming in. How did you uh, drive the sales flow? Did you use a, a big PR campaign or like influencers or did you just, you know, retain the customer through word of mouth? Okay. Um, yeah. Again, I think PR and influencers are really overrated. Um, there are many things I think are overrated. <laughs> but, but PR and influencers are definitely overrated. It, I mean, in, in the office, we usually think that all the PR agencies are just a bunch of morons that take, takes your money for, for you know, not any actual deliverable. And we, we internalized PR. And ever since we did that, it's gone so amazingly well. It's it's incredible. Uh, so so having PR matters, but hiring a PR agency is something I would significantly advise against. And and we did it with three of them, so I can really claim how bad they all were. Um, and um and and when you when you start, you don't have much money, so you might not want to give it to someone else anyway. If if you do PR, do it internally, do it smart, and get the word out. Now. You really have to be careful between dragging a correlation between PR and sales. I'm not sure PR drives sales. PR drives PR, which means mm -hmm. it's going to get the word out about your company. People are going to know it. And even with that, just for the record, last year we had one article in a major publication every second day, and 20% of the audience knew about it. So imagine the level of effort it takes to have everyone knowing you through PR. Just, you know. So PR gets you the word out, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna generate sales necessarily. If, if you want sales, advertising or word of mouth work better. 
influencer is kind of an in-between. It can work, it cannot work, depends how you do it. But I would never pay $5,000 for a fucking Instagram post. That I can promise. That's true. So, That's true. so at the end of the day, when we started, we <clears throat> did a bit of both. So we did a bit of the word of mouth with some reward when you would recommend your friends. And we did a bit of advertisement, but we didn't have much money. So we would buy what we could and, and see if it would work. But we were very bad at advertising in the beginning. We learned as we did it. And, you know, it was kind of a... You need to convince the investor to get money to advertise, but to convince the investor, you need to show that your advertising works. So it's, it's, it's a hard chicken and egg story to break from, out from. So we did it, but I guess we raised the money before we learned how to advertise really. Thank you. You first, because you're closest, Mindy. <laughs> Hi, Chris Conley from Tipbit. Did you sue the investors that backed out? Can you say that again? Did you sue the investors that backed out? Good question. Still didn't get it. Did you sue the investors that stepped out of the? Oh, agreement? sorry, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, I, it's like I never talk about him, so I was even surprised that I did. So no, I didn't, because at the time when he did that, I didn't have the money to do it. And once I had the money, I preferred to use it on something else, and it was more backward-looking than forward-looking. Now, he, he, ha he has gained my esteem for life, really. But, you know, I, I won't sue him or anything. I just, uh, I, I had people asking me if I knew them, and my answer was, yeah, they're real huge fucking assholes. <laughs> but um, but, but I, suing him wouldn't change anything to me. I, I don't care at this stage. I guess... The best answer to someone hurting you is success more than anything. And I think we've proven him wrong in many senses in that direction. So, yeah. Good for you. That guy in the back. <laughs> um, my question is, who are your role models? That's it. <laughs> who are my what? Role models. Uh, well, I don't know. I think, I mean, I guess that there are two levels to that question. One is who, who really inspired me most? And I would say, I would probably say just my parents. I mean, they raised me, gave me so much love and, and, and affection and, and taught me so many things in life and, and supported me in the tough times that they are really huge role model for me not just from a business standpoint, but just from a life standpoint. I, I hope I'll be, you know, not just a businessman, but a parent as good as what they were to me. And that, that's the first level and the most important. Everything else behind is kind of bullshit. Well, let's talk about the bullshit part. Who, who are the role model in the professional life? Who is great? Well, again, this subdivides into two parts. The guy you know, the guy you don't know. Stupid answer is, oh, Steve Jobs was so cool and Elon Musk is amazing. That's full of shit. You don't even know them. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what they do is great, but, but they might inspire you, yes, because they show you that it can be done by a human, which you also are. So it, it's, it can be inspiring. <laughs> but, but you don't know them. So I'll talk about people I know. And, and in the journey I've been through, there have been really two people that invested in the company and, and helped me. And, and taught me things on a weekly or monthly basis, which the first time I met them, I felt, fuck, they're so good. I want to be like that professionally. And, and I made my way up there in, in, in some ways and on some others, they are still teaching me. But um, I would really encourage as you, as you build a business to, to surround yourself with people that you feel you want to be like a couple of years down the road. And, and in my case, it's someone called Fabrice Grinda, who is an angel investor in New York and who inspired me very much. And someone else called Eve Sisteron, who is one of our main investors at a fund called Upfront Ventures and who is one of the smartest and most Zora person I've ever seen. So, yeah. Um, other lady in the back and then we'll start working our way forward again. Um, hi, so you are a data-driven lingerie business. Could you talk about the types of tests that you run and how that influences um, different components of the company? So 
inventory, advertising, and then also um, maybe the, one of the most fascinating insights that you've learned from running these tests. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess th there, are, there are two areas where engineering is required in terms of math behind the beauty of it. One is marketing. So we understand in a very sharp way where each dollar of revenues come from um, and allocating between different channel is not necessarily easy, especially when you have some which don't require a click like radio or television. And then you need to isolate word from mouse, from television, from things that people click then. I mean, it's a real mess to, to do and we're super strong in that. And this requires a lot of statistics behind. So it's like literally statistic scientists that help us do this. And um, that's an area where, because we understand, we can actually accelerate and spend more where we know it works. And we've been approached by gazillions of third parties, which all have their own great solution for data analytics, and they all really suck. So, so, so we've built everything internally. And when I speak to any other person from the startup community, whether it's the Dollar Shave Club, the Bonobos, the whatever of the world, no one has come close to an understanding of advertising the way we do. And that's why even if we were smaller in our earlier than most of them, because some started earlier and some just had a very strong launch, we are now in the process of becoming bigger than most of them because we know how to spend money uh, profitably, which is a real asset. And second asset, especially in lingerie, is inventory management, because you need to place an order when you're in advance. And when you grow a lot, committing to purchasing now what you will receive in your warehouse a year downward is a huge commitment, especially when you say, okay, I'm going to buy three times more, and there are thousand styles to buy. How much should I buy of each style? And for each style, how much should I buy of the 20 sizes? It, it's a real mess. Um, so we've put also a lot of statistics into this. We have built our own internal software to really understand the granularity of it. And, and it's countless months, if not years of work, if, if you put it into just human time that goes behind and from people who are the smartest I've, I've met. And, uh, you know, it, it's a huge asset for us again, because we understand how it works. So there is not much room left for hazard, for tune. And, and I think this is something I really like, which is being in control of your destiny when most people have to take a bet. That's a real edge. So yeah, there you go. Then I haven't hit anyone over here. I feel bad. You, Beth, right next to Josh. <laughs> Hi, Morgan. Um, my question is first, do you do design in house? And second, um, if you had no background in retail or fashion, how did you craft relationships with the uh, manufacturer? So design, I guess there are two types of design. There is the design of the product itself and the design of all the uh, mobile and website experiences. Um, regardless, the answer is we do everything in-house. Um, we Many things we started to do with a partner. And at some point, as you grow, you realize that having a partner is very limited because they will never understand your business the way you do. So if you can internalize, it's actually better, and, and, and we did it. That said, both for web design and for uh, product design, when we started, we would hire freelancers because I wouldn't be able to afford people internally. So we did both. What's better is better to have something great in-house, obviously, but when you don't have a choice, you do with what you can. And, and the, the way that I've built relationship with suppliers is, um, I mean, I didn't know anyone. so. I just took LinkedIn and I hit it hard, um, contacting people that had worked in the industry, trying to find manufacturers um, that would manufacture for other brands that were doing product like the one I wanted to have, trying to find on Google page 119, some sort of a reference to their suppliers and just, just grind it. And between consultants, random calls and, and and Google searches, I found what, what I wanted to find, but it's been hard. It's really hard. Like it took maybe a year and a half to go from, we don't know anything to, 
we have a supplier we like, maybe maybe even two year and a half if I think about it, because then even when you meet the guy, you can't manufacture directly with him or her. You have to put all this design into prototyping and, and the whole thing takes a year. So that's been, yeah, a hard battle. Okay. Well, I think we're out of time. <laughs>